Okay, awesome. We're good to go then. No, no, I'm not. Oh. I gotta go. I gotta go brush my hair. No, I'm kidding. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it looks good. Uh, I like the beard. That's. Uh, I wish I could grow a real beard. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's. Uh, it's. Uh, it's coming in. Um, I'm gonna start looking homeless soon, so I have to do something about it. Unfortunately. Yeah, how but, long you know. does it take you to get it that long? <sighs> Shit. Uh, you know, when you have a beard like this, you're not good at keeping track of time. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Things just sort of blow by and you you don't know. Isn't that amazing that that, like, the beard trend came back? Because it's got to be, it's nice for guys that can grow a cool beard like that. Because then it also, like, not only does it, I think it kind of looks cool, but also it's just, like, it's easier. Like, you don't have to shave now. That's, like, one thing that you can cross off your list. No, I, yeah, I could pass off laziness as a uh, fashion choice, a grooming choice. <laughs> exactly, yeah. It's cool. Yeah, no, I just, I just like beards is all, you know. <sighs> also, I don't have much of a chin, so. For chinless men, this uh, this is this has done us a very very good deed. Yeah, it definitely it, it looks and it looks manly. You know, that's it's kind of an interesting uh, time right now with gender. It's all you know, the other confusion and things. So, like, if you got a beard, people don't misgender you very much. You would think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love but kids the... can be so mean. Yeah, can they? Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, lady. I hear it every now and then. School buses driving got, by, you know. I got misgendered yesterday at the grocery store. Someone's like, "Hey, ma'am, I can help you over here." And I was like, "Ma'am?" I was like, "What?" Like, and then he said, "Oh, I mean, sir." I don't know if he was just fucking with me, or it was kind of weird. Yeah. At that point, times like this, all you can do is hang your head and ask for a coupon because you're offended. Exactly. Well, so let's talk about this new special. I watched it last night. So funny. Uh, how's it? How's the Thank reaction you. been from people? Um, have you been getting a good reaction from other people as well? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. It's been uh, mostly. It's 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 been pretty much all good. Yeah. You know, a lot of people. A lot of people in high school reaching out, saying hi. You know, girls who would never talk to me. A few of them, which is pretty cool. Um, you know, um, um, uh, just, uh, just, yeah, really, really good. Really, really good. I worked really hard on it, so I'm, I'm glad, but, uh, I expected to be about 5,000 views. I'm almost at 17,000 views. So yeah, that's, you know, that's everything's looking up. Well, and I feel like it's a, uh, the bigger thing to me is the clips, right? Cause some of your clips have really taken off and you can continue to make clips from this because i think you only have a, a handful right now but i mean you could chop the entire thing up into clips right yeah that's in the process of being done um i keep on getting this weird thing on tiktok to like um a copyright strike or something so i gotta figure that out maybe it's the music i'm using but um <clears throat> i gotta i gotta figure that out before i put more of them out it's a real pain in the ass i've always hated tiktok and now i just hate them even more yeah, I'm not a fan of TikTok. It is weird though, like because I'll do a clip of the podcast and I'll put it on TikTok, YouTube, and Instagram, and I never know which one is gonna blow up the most. Like I could put the it's exact same clip, and sometimes TikTok it blows up, and sometimes Instagram it does. But it's weird when like it'll have like thousands on one and like two hundred on the other. I'm like, I don't understand. It's the same clip. Yeah, um, I found if I sacrifice a goat, TikTok <laughs> will. Uh... Do the best if I sacrifice a chicken, Instagram, so on, so forth, you know? <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So this is amazing that you can make a special, because before it might have taken years to, like, break in and know the right people and all this, and now it's like all these comedians are just putting their stuff out on YouTube. Like, even Mark Norman had to, which I was like, dude, he's huge, and he had to put his out on uh, YouTube at first. Now he got one on Netflix, but um, I think that's great that you guys can do this on YouTube. And you did this cheap. It was only, like, three grand or something. Yeah, and half of that is because I'm too lazy to edit my own clips. So I've had to pay someone to do that. So that's including the price of the clips that have been already posted? Uh, all, all future clips, too, I paid in advance. Oh, so you already have, like, the other clips 
already edited and ready. You just haven't posted them yet. They're being edited and they're they're being taken care of. Wow. You might have to tell me what uh editing company this is. I, I I'd love to get somebody like I hate doing editing too. It's the, the worst part of all this stuff. Yeah, it's it's just my friend Shamil. He's doing an awesome job. I'll send you his info uh, after this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's yeah, he's 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 just a buddy and he I guess he started messing around with editing. So I was like, well, I'll just, you know, I'll hire him. Yeah, because I know oh. you can do uh, what's that Fiverr or whatever. I've used that for some other stuff before, and th- and that works really well, and it's like really affordable. Really? Yeah, yeah. I didn't. Uh, I didn't even look around. I just I, I like working with people I know and I like. That's true too. And then you can tell them exactly <clears throat> what you want. It's a lot easier because so, there is some that I, I one time I had this thing. I was trying to do like a new, uh, like a cartoon kind of comic for my podcast cover of me. And I sent it to the person and she just did not get it. And I was like, and I couldn't get my money back. I was like, well, I guess I'm just out this like 50 bucks or whatever. Yeah. Well, when you're a comedian, you really know you don't have to worry about stuff like that. There's always a comedian who does what you need them to do. You know, I got a great, I got a bunch of friends who do graphic design. I got a bunch of friends who do editing. All, you know, all these people, you know, they look for creative outlets in other ways. So when you know a lot of comedians, you can just, you can find someone and uh, you know exactly what they're going to do beforehand because you've seen their work. Yeah. They do you do it over Facebook. Yeah. Do you do stuff for other comedians? Like, do you, do you write jokes for other comedians or do anything else? Like what besides, is just writing jokes your specialty pretty much? Yeah, no, I just write and tell jokes. That's it. I don't even put on, I, I started putting on a show recently. Hopefully it'll work out but I really like to keep it simple. Yeah, no, you're really good at it. Um, I loved all the, there was a lot of fat jokes in this. What are your thoughts on like fat shaming and stuff like that? Cause I saw something yesterday that said like, if you're concerned for somebody who's overweight, that's considered fat shaming. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. I mean, look, uh, if I can make fun of something, I'm going to make fun of it. And unfortunately for us fats, uh, it's just, it's a way if people are going to make fun of people who are fat. Like I, I would never, I, you know, it's one thing to like harass someone online. Like, I think it's gross. Like when people on YouTube who don't even know the person are like, you're a fat bitch, obviously. But for the sake of stand up comedy, if you're just talking in generalities, you know, honesty is a big part of comedy. So if you're going to be honest about being fat, then you're going to have to say, well, you'll die sooner and you're less attracted to less attractive to the opposite sex. And it's mostly your fault, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so you have to, like when, when we can't get around it, I can't act like I'm not doing this to myself with Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, I had this guy on um, the other day and he he's, he's a bigger guy and he, he punched out, I don't know if you know the misfits, but he punched out Glenn Danzig and he went viral for this. And uh, he wrote a book and it's all the hate mail he got. And it's all these like, just, you know, people calling him a fat, fat ass and all these things. And I mean, so you're, if you're able to laugh at some of that stuff, I mean, that kind of helps you get through it. Right. Yeah. That's the whole point of a sense of humor is when <laughs> things are bad. Yeah. And you, cause you talk about your, your bullying jokes and you talk about you were bullied. Is that kind of how you dealt with it as a kid? I guess so. I don't know. I haven't been to a shrink in a while. <laughs> but I mean, that's because that's hard. Like if you're if you get bullied as a kid and then you if you can't like fight back with your humor or you can't fight back and just kick their ass, like then you just kind of have to take it. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Um, yeah. Being the funny kid helps. Being the funny kid definitely helps. Also, um, when you when you when bad things in life happen, if you're able to laugh at them, it's, it's a way to get through it, too. Like being an alcoholic is absolutely horrible, but it's also hilarious, you know, like, like being a drunk is really, really funny, especially if you're sober for a few years and you can just sort of look back on it and be like, I was drinking a fucking handle of vodka a day. How's that possible? You just think of all the weird ways your car has been parked when you woke up the next day, you know? You know, yeah, it's, you have uh, a lot of good stories like that of, of the drunken times, like good, uh, funny stories from that. Um, I, I, I guess so. Every drunk should have funny stories or else you wasted it. You know, yeah, you should be at least having fun or, or, or remembering funny things. 
you what's know? the what's the most fucked up you ever were like with because you did other shit too right didn't you do like heroin and a couple times and i did heroin a couple times yeah one time i said i'm doing heroin it's like holy shit i'm doing heroin the other time i snorted a line of heroin i said wow this is fucking really good coke and my friend laughed at me uh um so you know i only did the i did heroin once i only snorted i never shot it or anything like that and that works when you snort it because isn't that what the lady did in pulp fiction and then she freaking uh had the od or whatever yeah um it does work when you snort and you're actually far less likely to od if you oh. just snort it yeah and, but you don't get uh you didn't get addicted to it. it wasn't like the best feeling you ever felt and then you had to keep chasing it no um to be honest i was more anxious about it. i was like holy shit i just did heroin what the fuck is wrong with me it's sort of that's sort of the whole thing so i just did it the two times i did coke much more than that and alcohol was a daily thing you know yeah you know. how did you because I, I thought you heard uh heard you say that you started drinking in middle school that's great. like was it with other kids or just you steal your parents booze or like what what motivated you to start drinking in middle school um uh, what motivated you to drink in middle school you drank in middle <laughs> school right you had a couple of beers you hung out uh i mean i no, yeah, not middle school high school i think more so yeah high school i think for middle school i was still like i guess i was immature i was still like playing with gi joes and stuff so when i hear these stories of kids like having sex and doing drugs in middle school i'm like wow you guys are a little more uh, advanced yeah, than me. i like didn't that. have sex in middle school <laughs> Oh, not even with my GI Joes. I had no sex in middle school. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I was dude. Just my friends were like, "Hey, let's get some beers." I was like, "Yeah, dude, a fucking of course. It's the coolest thing ever, you know, drinking alcohol like an adult." And isn't you it? Know? But isn't that first beer? You're just like you kind of fake it. You're like, "Yeah, this is great," but really, you're like, "Oh, this is disgusting." Nah, I mean, I, I, in you know, I heard beer wasn't good, and I didn't love it, but I didn't hate it either. I drank uh, Miller Genuine Drafts. I used to drink a bunch of those. That was like the first 30 we ever got. And we got Bush Light and stuff like that. And Yeah, I mean, I was just happy to be drinking beer. I mean, I, I didn't really care if it tasted all that great. I mean, they tell you it's an acquired taste anyways. But it, beer, it's, it doesn't take long. It doesn't take long to acquire the taste for it, man. Well, yeah, and especially now with like Bush Light, actually, I'll say it's not that bad for a light beer. But now with all the the the, uh, the micro brews and stuff, they have so many different uh, flavors. I I love going to the breweries and getting the sampler and trying all the different ones. Uh, I mean, that's the thing for me now. Is I don't drink that much, but like I love the different flavors. But I think um, I heard you talk about non-alcoholic beer, and I, I think there's some good non-alcoholic beers too. Like I've gone periods without drinking, and I you can do non-alcoholic beer, and you can do obviously coke without rum and stuff like that the only thing that i would always miss when i wasn't drinking was a red wine because that's something that you non-alcoholic wine tastes like shit i can imagine i what's the point you know i was never a big i liked white wine i didn't really like red wine and mostly because i just like drinking cold stuff when i always i always drink iced coffee and everything like that i don't like warm or medium or room temperature liquids usually yeah, no, that's uh, definitely. But I mean, I think too, it's like when you're drinking the handle, then it's like, I I've gotten to those points too, where it's like, you're doing, I remember my grandpa, we were at this wedding and he's like, all they got at this uh, wedding is wine and beer. That doesn't really have the medicinal purposes that I'm looking for. Like he, he drank like martinis and stuff. So when you're drinking the handle a day, you're not really looking for the taste, obviously. Martinis, by the way, everyone thinks they're for fancy schmancy folks. It's the most economical way to get hammered. <laughs> no i think you're right my grandpa was definitely uh <clears throat> a little bit tight with the dog and he he would have these he i only drink in one martini but it was like pure booze oh yeah, yeah that's what it is uh just like you know you get some a little bit of olive you know olive whatever in it um i usually got just a splash of lime juice other than that just straight up vodka and you drink two of those you are fine three of them you're really really drunk and you know, I drank six of them once, but that was in my like heyday, my heyday. Like I, I, I was a bill. Co I was a medical bill collector for a while. Have you ever been a bill collector? No, Probably not right. No. Yeah. So you had. To, so is that like? The, oh wait, no. I'm thinking of um, 
what's the thing that Seth Rogen did in that Pineapple Express? That was a, a, a like a where they tried to get people to go to court. But no, this is that sounds like similar kind of job where everyone hates you, right? I was on the phone and I had to call people who were who didn't have med who didn't pay medical bills. Some of them were really really sick, and it just it was it was the worst job I like I ever had. I got paid pretty well and everything like that, but just doing it over and over again killed me. I used to get hammered every day. I would drive right down the street and have on average four martinis just to get through the job. One time I did six. I found out years later. Yeah, I found out years later they used to call me crazy vodka guy. Oh, so they knew that you were drunk and they didn't care? I I mean, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's not their fault. I mean, letting me drink six martinis and drive out of there is pretty wild. But it only happened the one time. Well, so wait, you're drinking on the job? They're Then they're okay with that? Lunch break. And that, They weren't okay. okay with it. Oh. They didn't know about it. Okay. Yeah. Cause I used to work in the school. So like we could never, I always hear stories of like people go and have a couple beers at lunch and stuff. I'm like, you couldn't do that at this. If you had like one beer at lunch on a school job, like you'd probably get fired. Yeah. If they found out they would have fired my ass too. If they found out they just didn't for some reason, I guess I was really good at chewing gum. Yeah. that's. <laughs> I can't figure it out. Well, and then like, yeah, I ended up quitting that job. Yeah. Well, and now like, and I think I, I heard you talk about edibles too. And that's a big thing. I wonder how many people are taking edibles just like when you go out into society and you like, you go to the mall, like how many people are on edibles? <laughs> Cause that's so easy. And how would you tell, I'm sure there's some probably sort of drug tests you could give them, but there's probably a lot of people that work on edibles and just go out into the world. Yeah. Some people are better off high, you know? Um, I don't think it's a lot of people, but I do know people, they just smoke weed and they just get their shit done. Uh, so they, it really helps a lot of people with anxiety. So some people just like sort of need it. Um, I just, it doesn't help me at all. I, I mean, it just helps me enjoy a movie more. I never go out and about on it, you know? Um, but, uh, yeah, I think a lot of people fucking smoke pot, take it. I know I, I work with people all the time get high every chance they got at work yeah it's you know? for me it's a uh, i think i was always one of those people that kind of got paranoid with it and then i just stopped doing it for years and then it became legal here again or uh, for the first time and i was like oh maybe i should maybe i should try it again and see if i like it and for me it's still kind of like a lot of times i just either get paranoid or i just get like cloudy like i had tommy chong on and i was like Okay, I gotta smoke pot because I have Tommy Chong on my podcast. So I smoke. You have to you smoke know, pot, yes. Yeah, you have to. And so, but then I realized I was like, dude, towards the end of the podcast, I was like, I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. And I was like, it was just all cloudy. And I was like, mm, I'm not, I want to be like a Joe Rogan and smoke pot and do it, but I'm like, I just don't think that's really me. Like, I'm just, I'm better just sober. Kind of boring, I know. Yeah. I yeah, yeah, most people are better just sober. I here's the I I never I don't go on stage high. I barely ever go out high. It's good for one thing and one thing only. I turn on a movie, I turn on a TV show, I turn on some music, and I just freaking chill out. It is nothing but relaxation, period, and discussion. That's interesting. So you never get the paranoid shit. You never get the shit where you're like doing like that, like oh, sort I do. of stick in your head and all that. It's the opposite. Whenever I'm in it public. Relaxes you. Oh. Whenever I'm in public, it does. Hmm. It's like it, Whenever I'm in social situations, I can't get out of my own head. But if I'm in my room by myself with the fucking shades drawn, you know, then, you know, for some reason, um, for some reason, that's the only way I can do it. I just by myself. Yeah, you've, you've watched a movie high, right? Oh, yeah, dude. I remember watching like South Park one time and I was like, I was like, holy shit, this is what the show was made for. It was made for watching it on weed. Like it, it, it was a totally different experience. The colors were brighter. It was way funnier. Like it was totally different. Yeah. Yeah. I used to get high before every new South park, every single one of them. Even if I only smoked weed that one time, I would just get high and watch uh, the fucking it's, it's the best that, that that's what weed's made for, for me. Um, I, these people get high and go on stage. I don't, I don't know how they do it. I really, really don't. But again, it, you know, it affects everybody differently. Yeah. Well, and I think sometimes yeah. you can tell, like sometimes a guy will get up there and he'll talk about like, 
how much he loves weed. And then you can cut, you can totally tell they're stoned. And then I feel like, yeah, they're not very quick or they're kind of losing track of the jokes. And it, it, I don't think it enhances it for him a lot of time. I think it no. actually, hurts him. it hurts the audiences too. Like I I've done a couple of weed rooms, you know, 420 friendly comedy shows. And um, I haven't done one since I went to one and just no one got the jokes it was just, it was so fucking, it was like pulling teeth. They were like, huh? What? I don't. Mm? I tweeted that night. I said, never send a comedian to do a strobe lights job. And ever since I have decided I'm not doing comedy for fucking high people, they don't fucking get it. That's a really interesting point. Yeah, because with the legal weed everywhere, not ever, but a lot of states, I mean, there's got to be a lot more people high. So, but, but it, aren't they just kind of mixed in everywhere too? Like, I mean, anywhere you go, there could be a lot of people that either smoked on their vape or they did edibles before. Yeah. We're a little more high now. <laughs> yeah. We all something. Well, that's good that it's, it's not, uh, but that, I, you know, yeah, that's not, um, you can still do that recreationally. Whereas like, I mean, obviously you can't recreationally do heroin. And uh, the booze, like, that's cool that you can still do the, you have something that you can kind of have fun with. Yeah, I can do mushrooms. I can do Molly. I can do LSD. I haven't done LSD in a while just because it's a fucking two day hangover. It's not even worth it anymore. Uh, it just starts to kick the shit out of you when you're old. But mushrooms, uh, other psychedelics, things like that I can do. I have to get away from Xanax because uh, if you know any drunks out there who are just like, I'll switch to Z Xanax activates the exact same pleasure zones of the brain as alcohol. It's almost the same thing. So I, I have to steer clear of that. Opiates, no. I've seen one too many documentaries. Um, you know, cocaine isn't fun anymore without alcohol. Crack, come on. I can't I'm, I'm I can't be doing crack. You know, it's just it's just silly. 37-year-old man doing crack, you know, for the first, you know, getting into it late in life. Um, and you know, meth, obviously I don't touch, but I, yeah. I can still, I can still dabble. Yeah. What, what is Molly? Like I've never, I've never done, I've always been scared of that one because they always said like, Oh, if you do uh, ecstasy more than six times, you have to be on antidepressants for the rest of your life or. Mm, that might be true. I'm on antidepressants. I did a bunch of uh fucking ecstasy in, after high school. I haven't done Molly in, in a little bit. What they tell you is this, just wait 45 days after you, before you do Molly again, um, because that gives your brain time to recuperate, fix itself. Hmm. You know, so I don't think, you know, you can only do Molly or ecstasy a set amount of times. You just, A, don't want to make a habit out, and B, when you do do it, you need to give your brain some fucking, some time to rebuild the dopamine levels and shit like that. Right. Yeah. Do you ever try like natural stuff like uh, meditation or exercise or anything like that? I know for me, like I love, I'm in Arizona, it's hot as hell here. So I always go swimming and swimming. Like for me is like, it clears my mind like a lot. Like I'm like, oh, okay. Like I feel physically, you know, it helps me a little too, but like mentally, I feel like that really clears my mind up. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, swimming, swimming is unbelievable. It feels awesome. I wish I could do it more like, but I can't really, it's, it's tough to find a pool in New York. Like, I'm sure I could find a pool, but, you know, like, it's probably, it, like, it's just filled to the brim. Any And anytime there is a pool, because there's so few of them, you know, you're just, you know, you're with a bunch of traffic. And I don't even, you know, I can't afford a gym that has, a, like, a pool in my own lane I can swim in and stuff like that. But swimming is the absolute fucking most relaxing exercise there is. It's, it's perfect. I love it so much. I, yeah, I, I need to start doing it more. Yeah, I agree. So if you're in New York, Seth, so you were originally in Rhode Island. So now you're in New York. New Yorkers, they walk a lot though, right? Don't they walk? Because I know when we went to New York, I think I walked like 16 miles one day. I mean, we were doing all the touristy shit and stuff too, but. Yeah. Yeah. There's the best way to see New York too, is just walk around. The best way to explore New York. So, you know, I walk two, three miles a day. Easy, easy. Sometimes much more than that. Yeah. You know, you're just going back and forth doing shows and like you know you try to get up as many times as possible take the train but you know it's always going to be at least a half mile walk to you where you're going you know so i mean i think i lost a little bit of weight in new york just by be just because of how much you have to fucking walk um it's um 
you know, I, you know, I eat like shit, but you can eat like shit and lose weight here. You know, if, if you walk enough. Yeah. So you said, uh, going to different shows. I can't remember. I think it might've been Liz Mealy or one of the comedians from New York. I had on, they were saying that they sometimes would do five different shows in one day. What's the most shows you've done in a day. Do you do that? Do you, where you bounce from club to club to club to do sets? Uh, I think four is the most I've ever done in a day. I, um, I did, I think I did five mics once like in Boston from Boston to Rhode Island. I did a, did a whole thing. That's it. But like when I, but when you first start, that's when you have to do that shit. When you have to just fucking hit show after my, you have to get on stage as much as possible when you've been doing it for a long time. It's, um, it's more about the quality of the stage time you get. Yeah, that makes sense. So how long I, have you been doing comedy for then? I couldn't figure that out because you, you obviously, like you said, you've had these other jobs. So comedy wasn't your full time thing or initially. No, uh, it's been 12 years. Wow. So it took 11 years to uh, it took 11 years to even to, to squeak out even a, a, a minuscule living that I have right now off stand up comedy. 11 years. Damn. So some people, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, how old Unless, were you when you first when then you were you like 20 or something or uh no, I was like 20. Uh, you know what? It might be longer than 12 years. Um, I don't know. I was somewhere between 23 and 25. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was quite a blur back then. You remember quite a blur. Do you remember the first time you got up? I mean, I'm assuming most people's first time they bomb. I did great my first time and I did great my second time. And then I bombed for the next six months. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> so yeah, it was a dark time. That's amazing that you kept going for those six months then and didn't just give up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, you it really is. Did you see a light at the end of the tunnel? Did, were you working on things and tinkering and trying to get better? Like what kept you going if it were kept continue to bomb? Just those first two, remembering the feeling from the first two times? Um, I, I don't know. I just really, I just really love stand up. I used to watch it all of the goddamn time, like all the time as a kid. I, I loved it. So I just kept on writing new stuff and none of it worked. I had, I had like a new five minutes every week and it was just all trash but trying all that out helped it helped speed up the process of me learning how to really write a joke so after those six months i started figuring stuff out a little bit and then after a year i had a, a solid eight to ten minutes it was not it, it was trash by you know regular standards but as far as i concerned i was concerned after 6 months of just bombing all the time just to have a little bit of reliable material was just it was it felt amazing it felt unbelievable so it was worth it and i kind of always knew it would be worth it yeah so was your style always uh, this, I don't even know what you call it, like offensive. Like it's not offensive to me because I watch a lot of comedies. And I think that's what, if you watch a lot of comedy, I think people are really going to enjoy this special um, because you're not just doing the typical like predictive joke. Like I, there's a lot of comedians where like, I know where this joke is going. Whereas yours were like, I was like, oh, he's not going to go there. And then you went there. Is that how your comedy always was the, after that six months? Or when did you develop this? Like kind of like, a, I don't know what you call it, like offensive style. Um, I don't know. It was... It was all really sort of a blur the first six months. Um, um, I, 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 I tried writing clean. I tried writing dirty. None of it. Nothing really worked for that first six months. So it's hard to even consider that. Like, I don't even count that. Like, I wasn't even doing comedy back then. I was just on a stage talking for five minutes, just hoping it makes sense, you know? It was like Hail Mary attempts at a joke. I literally had that little idea of what the fuck i was doing um and then i started getting going to open mics and um i instead of just bringer shows i just did bringer shows for a while i started going to actual open mics in front of comedians and because i did a lot of open mics and i didn't get booked a lot early um i would only perform two comedians 
And performing in front of comedians is way different than performing in front of regular people. So you have to go a little dirty a lot of times. You have to go extra dark to make those people fucking laugh. You just have to. No, that's exactly <laughs> true. Yeah, because I, like I said, I mean, I watch so much comedy. I've done a little comedy. I, it wasn't really, I watch people like you and I'm like, I can't do that shit. So that's why I do the podcast stuff. But yeah, it's, I think that's what what um, is amazing about yours that if you've heard, if you feel like you've heard every comedian, every joke, then watch your special because it's 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 a different level. That's why I would think like, the reaction is the reaction from other comedians really good as well. Yeah, they, they've always been my biggest fans. Fucking other comics, my only fans, I should say. Yeah, is, is that when you started? When you said you went to those open mics, did you make friends with a lot of other comedians? And did any of them like help you or give you advice or uh, like help your help you with your jokes? No, not in Boston. Um, uh, in Rhode Island, that's where I started meeting people i really liked people were good to me uh was it was it was providence i'll never forget it i'll never uh never forget that like that's why i still love providence this day i was just meeting guys like my people are still friends with me this day like uh rob green and craig boudria a lot of them james creelman a lot of them actually quit comedy um but uh they were really good they were really really good we had a really good solid scene a really good nucleus of young open mic comedians in Rhode Island. I got in with those crew and, um, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's where I started meeting friends. That's where people started noticing me. That's where I, that's where you can say whatever you want, Rhode Island. Those people, they just don't give a fuck. They really don't. If you're a dirty comedian wrote uh, Providence, Rhode Island is heaven for offensive comedy. That's interesting. You say that, uh, your friends it's also are also heaven. It's also heaven if you like Portuguese food or strip clubs. <laughs> okay. Good to know. <laughs> Just good to know. Yeah. Good to know. All right. Well, so yeah, explain that though, that your friends quit. Why did they, if they were so funny, why did they quit? Is it, is it just like for life? They weren't making enough money or what was, what happened there? That's always fascinating to me when you see talent go to waste. I hate it. I mean, it, it mostly happens. Good comedians usually quit because they just get passed by shit comedians. It happens sort of all the time. Just, uh, you know, some girl will be hot. She'll get on shows. Uh, there'll be some guy. He just knows how to talk to people. He knows how to network. Some guys, they don't know how to network, really. They don't have any charm about them. They just keep sending emails to bookers, and email and bookers just break. And they're putting hacks on really good shows just because they're sick of being annoyed by the guy, you know? So there's a lot that goes into getting stage time, and sometimes it isn't about just, like, who's the funniest, especially at those sort of lower beginning levels. It's more about how you can approach someone, um, you know, how, you know, you know how you know how to send an email the right way. A lot of it is sort of real-life skills that people have, being able to look someone in the eye and, and confidently tell them what you're about and everything like that, you know? And uh, so a lot of people who aren't very creative, who aren't weirdos, like the really good comedians I know, they get ahead, even though their material is. Mm. So in that beginning, when that happens over and over and over again, it can fucking really crush someone. And they're like, I don't understand. I'm good at this. I'm fucking good at this. I'm doing something different. You're just bringing up some jerk who barely who can just stand up there and talk for seven minutes, you know? Like it's it's very valuable to just be able to talk sometimes without offending anyone, even if you're not even all that funny. If you're just good looking or likable enough, you can just sort of get away with being up there. And as long as you don't cause any issues, that's very valuable to bookers. That is you know, like that very insightful and very true. I think you're you're right on with all that. It's kind of sad though, because like you said, then that makes the really good comedians sometimes quit. And I've had some really funny comedians on my show that some people may have never heard of, but to me, I'm like, these are some of the funniest people on the planet. And so that is really interesting that hopefully they don't, they don't quit. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it just, it just, it, it really sucks. It really sucks when really like, I've seen a lot of great comedians, like fucking people who were just borderline, like geniuses that just, just like, I'm sick of this. No, no more. Can't take it. Cause they can still, even if they're more niche, uh, I mean, they would still have a cult following enough that they could still make it, but they're just not going to be at that next level. And then they decide to just give up. 
because they can't see even getting to the next level because they're not making any progress. Their act, their act is making progress. Their act is making progress because they're taking chances. They're doing what you should do. So uh, they're still they're funny and they're getting funnier, but it just doesn't seem to matter to you know certain gay keep gay keepers and local scenes sometimes, and they just go with the plain Joe Schmo guy who's not going to offend anyone. He's just going to go out there. He's going to talk about dating for a little bit, and he's going to talk about this for a little bit. Maybe he'll talk about his mental illness for a little bit. You know, blah 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 blah, just sort of you know cookie cutter horseshit that just sort of makes bookers happy because what a booker wants to do he wants to make sure that like no one leaves before the headliner gets on a lot so for a feature act they don't want taking any chances they don't care if they they don't leave their seat that's a really good point and a good observation so that actually hurts like somebody like yourself because there, I'm assuming that there's some been some people that have walked out of your shows or or got. I know you mentioned one in the in the uh, in the special about a woman that got kind of upset with you. But does that happen a lot to you that people um, get offended at your stuff and then yell at you after the show or walk out? Um, one time I did a show in uh, Rhode Island, and uh, a woman came up to me. This was like six years ago. So a woman came up to me after the show and she says, "Hi, I'm from Brooklyn." And we're trying to stop people like you. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> oh, okay. You know, I did. It happens. It happens every now and then. It's not that. It's not that big of a deal. Most most of the time, what happens when you have a bad set is no one confronts you or anything. You just sort of bomb on stage, and people don't like to hear it. Yeah. Do you ever have the opposite? Because <laughs> the the. The jokes. See, I know they're jokes. I understand how comedy works. So I understand you're kidding. You're not really going to kill people and rape people and things. These these, You're doing jokes. But you ever have people come up to you after the show that kind of like that say that they related to the jokes? Like it had the opposite effect. You're like, oh, you're not getting it. These are jokes. I don't really like I'm not really like racist and things like that. Yeah. um, Every now and then I have to tell someone like, dude, they're just jokes. I'm not running for town selectman. Um, like I'm not, this is not a platform or anything of a serious way to live your life. You know, you, and it, no one ever says like, that's, that's perfect. That's, that's, that's not even like, you just get a vibe from someone that they like you for the wrong reason every now and then. You yeah. Know? I definitely like got that one. The special I was like, Oh, I hope some people aren't like gravitating towards this because it, it, it fuels like, and that, that's what probably that Brooklyn woman is saying is like, we want to stop people like you, but it's like, yeah, but you're doing it as, as a joke. Like you're, it's more like you're making fun of people like that. Is that's how I take mm-hmm. it? Yeah, I think that's the best way to take it. That's how it's meant, you know. But it's my job as a comedian to make that clear without making it clear, you know. Um, how do I put it? You know, it's inferred by how ridiculous what I'm saying is that I don't believe it. Right. That's what's that's what makes it so funny though. That's what made me yeah. laugh so hard. Cause I'm like, oh, like, cause nobody would really say those things or think those things. It's it's ludicrous, which is that's what is, makes you laugh. Even if they did believe them, they wouldn't say it. Like, like that's the thing. If someone right. believed everything that I said on stage, they would probably keep that to themselves. You know, if someone's saying the things I'm saying, there's a 99% chance they're a joke and a one percent chance that they're literally out of their fucking mind definitely yeah oh. well and that's that's the debate right now with it's just comedy and and art and gen censorship and all that it's weird that we're talking about all that stuff again because i thought we kind of settled that in the 80s or was all the you know the satanic panic and trying to cancel heavy metal and stuff and then it was mm-hmm. like okay well we're nobody gives a shit about that anymore and now it's like we're kind of coming back to that in a way but now it seems like it's loosening back up again uh, I think it was a few years ago. I think five or six years ago, uh, people just sort of hopped on the PC train, even if they didn't actually believe it themselves, just because they didn't want to get in trouble. But that's slowly – people are jumping off that thing. It, it's just – it's never going to last because people like to laugh. And people like uh, people like dangerous cinema, and they like you know they, they like things like that. They just do. you know. I mean if you're saying – 
that someone shouldn't be able to tell certain jokes, then how come you get to make horror movies, which are literally just people killing each other? You know? I feel, yeah, I feel like that's like, way worse. Yeah, but then people will be like, well, 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 hold on, hold on. They're going after comedians. That's fine. I don't have a sense of humor, but I like horror movies. You know? Or, oh, wait, they're going after death metal? I love death metal. Hip-hop? Don't go after hip-hop. So, you know, you can, you can attack pretty much anything you want to. Anything right. that's fun. That's why I it's, love. It's, yeah, I love freedom. I love uh, I love being able to make the choice and stuff. Like even, and I I think some of the hip hop stuff is just hilarious. Like the 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 wet ass pussy song. I think that's one of the funniest songs. <laughs> I listen to that and I just and if I, if you've ever heard Ben Shapiro read the lyrics, I mean, I just only I, like I, only like seven hundred times. I've only heard that like seven hundred times. It's really funny. Yeah. But people, people, get, people getting mad about a song about a pussy. Like, it's, what, what are we doing here? Like, what are we doing? Yeah. Well, you mentioned you know? horror movies. You love horror movies too, right? I actually prefer action movies, but I'll watch horror movies too. Oh. Like, the only good movies getting made now are horror movies, it seems like sometimes. Have you seen any good new ones? I'm always looking for new ones to watch. What's the uh, newest horror movie I saw that I really liked? Shit. So it's hard to remember the name. Did you ever see? Did you see the new one? I think it's called Barbarian. That one was. Really I good. did, I did. I really liked Barbarian. I really liked it. It was really good. It was creepy, and that woman was just so gross. I thought it. I thought it was really, really fucking good. Justin Long is like, he's fucking big in the horror man. He's he's like a horror icon. That guy. Yeah. Seriously. Well, the guy that made it. I think he was a, he's like a comedy guy. He's from the whitest kids, you know, show or whatever. I didn't. And I, when I saw that, I was like, really? Well, yeah. It's interesting. Like, and also with the, what's the Jordan the, Peele com comedian Jordan too. Peele, I was going to say that he did that really good horror movie too. And he's from the comedy background. Yeah. Yeah. There was a, there's a movie called Judas and the black Messiah. that was written by a pair of twins or comedians. I forget their name, but the food movie was fucking incredible. Like I'll have to check that one out. Yeah, comedians all like comedians. Every comedian I know, almost every single one of them, just watches a ton of movies. So it makes sense that we're good at them. Well, and comedians are. It makes sense that co comedians can make horror movies because from the comedians I've interviewed, a lot of them are very dark, or they have a dark side to them that they, you know, that's underneath all the comedy. Especially the clean ones. Those guys are out of their fucking mind, sick and twisted fucks. <laughs> Really? They really Wait. oh they really are. Yeah, yeah. Really? It's, it's oh, like when, Bob Saget? Uh, no, Bob Saget's dirty. Well, yeah, but he, he would dirty. pretend to be clean on uh, America's Funniest Home Videos in Full House. It, There's a lot of people exactly. like when I grew up as a kid, I didn't know he was a dirty comic. Yeah. Um, no, that's the that's sort of the most well known thing in comedy. Like if you're a clean comic, then you're sort of dirty on the inside and you just don't share it with people. So it's, give me some uh, examples of some clean comics that you that you know that are dirty on the inside. <laughs> uh, the best example is the guy who was an actual rapist. <laughs> I forget his name, but he was a he, he he was the rapist comedian. He would go around. He never told jokes about rape, though. I guess his act was clean as a whistle, but he was just <laughs> he was just he he actually like you know. Are you talking about Bill Cosby or? Are you well, he's yeah, him, him. He's the most famous one. Um, but there was another guy. But but oh, there you was know what, another rapist comedian? Jesus. Yes, yeah. He wasn't nearly as big. He was like, you know, he would tour into colleges, and he never got big or anything. I think I heard about this story. Yeah, creepy. Yeah, but you know what? Bill Cosby is actually probably the absolute best example there is. No one did cleaner comedy than Bill Cosby. Nobody. And then, you know, he's doing all that heinous, awful shit. I'm not saying all clean comics are bad people. I'm just saying they tend to be darker, actually, when you speak to them, than dirty comics do. Because dirty comics, I feel like they get it out. They get the evil out. Mm -hmm. Well, clean comics just sort of sit in the evil and use it to make fun of, you know, lines at the post office you know, <laughs> or yeah. Petco or something. It's kind of like those preachers that uh, there was bigger more in the eighties, but there's still some that are like that where they're like really like, you know, uh, fire and brimstone and like, you know, anti this and anti that, but then secretly they're really like an evil person themselves. Oh yeah. And, and kinky too. They're drinking like German shepherd piss, you know, at a fucking gay orgy. 
Like, and, and, and they're telling people how to live this clean life. It happens absolutely all the time. That's, you know, like a lot of people like, a, like, uh, I forget where I read this, but if someone's like a sociopath or a psychopath, if someone's a really antisocial person, they will almost always try to project the opposite of what they are. Yeah. It's like, well, that's like they, um, uh... They don't know how to be like a human, so they're just like acting. And some of them are, I guess, good actors. Yeah. Yes. And some of them aren't good actors. Steven Seagal didn't fool anybody. <laughs> you know, everyone He's knew that guy was death. a shithead. Yes, he see, is. I saw something the other day that said, and this was this was like, it's an interesting fact. Uh, and I and I and I Googled it in Israel. He did a reggae album where he like sang in a reggae like accent. Have you seen this? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's making the rounds on the internet. Um, I want the punani. Give me the punani. He sings, yes. "Give me the punani." That's something. Of, that's something an insane person does. Can you imagine being a movie star and having an ego that says, "Now you have to be a famous singer"? Like that's that's insane. And like, a reggae just... singer at that, not like <laughs> you know, easy listening or something, or I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, a reggae singer. Imagine imagine tomorrow if you thought you could pull that off. Yeah. Just out of the blue, you said, I'm going to sing reggae, and people are going to love it. <laughs> As a white guy, yeah. That'd be, that'd yeah. Be crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I could yeah I I could talk about Seagal all podcast, but I better not because then you know everybody but seven fucking lunkheads will you know stop listening. No, tell me about Seagal. What is your? I remember my dad used to take me to those uh, movies when we were kids. Uh, like my mom would have like a party or something, and he'd take me and my brothers. He'd be like, "Hey, we're gonna go see a Seagal." It was either Seagal or Van Damme, or uh, what was the other? Like I guess some Arnold movies, but Van Damme and uh, and Seagal, I feel like were the big ones where we it would just be like a guy thing, and it just go. And they were all the same movie. It was just him kicking ass yeah. and people up, and it, there were some good ones. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I enjoyed them a lot. Uh, especially my drinking days, because, you know, there's no plot to worry about. You just have to worry about a guy kicking someone. Um, yeah, those, the Seagal movies are insane. They're insane to watch now. It's like a time capsule because, like, sometimes you'll watch a movie and you'll be like, oh, I can't believe. Like, they can't. They couldn't do that now. Right. That's a big thing. Oh, they couldn't make that movie now. I watch a movie called Mark for Death by Steven Seagal every now and then. I don't know how they made it back then. If I'm sure you've probably seen it. The movie is just Steven Seagal killing Jamaican people. That's the whole, yes, you're right. whole movie. The whole movie. He just hunts down Jamaicans and kills them because they're, you know, drug dealers in a town. But the crazy part of the movie is like towards the end, they like he kills so many of them that they all just sort of retreat. So he actually goes to Jamaica to kill more Jamaicans. He runs out of Jamaicans to kill in the town. So he gets on a plane and hunts more Jamaicans down. It's insane. Like I how? Need, I need to rewatch that. I definitely remember. I was going to say when we, and you said Steven Seagal, that was the one I remember the most. I don't know why. Yeah, Cause I just remember there was a lot of just, I mean, it was violent. It was more than just an action movie. Like he was just like murdering these people. A lot of them with his bare hands. I felt like, Oh yeah. He was breaking hands and, like oh my head he had this move where he would pull your arm down here and break it at the elbow that he would always do he was always breaking arms and limbs and legs and fucking oh my god like when you're a kid that that's it's the coolest shit ever because that's what you you know yeah you know it's 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 fucking awesome uh and it's still fun to watch in a in a dumb way um but like like i couldn't like that like when you look back at some of those movies now you're like what the fuck were they thinking they can get away with that? You know, just just literally hunting down Jamaicans in the night with him and a it's just him and a football coach. He's not even a cop anymore. He like quit two weeks earlier, so he's just freelancing this. Just on his like, he's not even on the clock hunting Jamaicans. He's just doing it as almost like a hobby. It's insane how racist that movie is. Insane. I need to rewatch that now. You should do movie reviews. Do you, you have a podcast, right? You don't do movie reviews on it, though. 
No, no, no. It, it, I just have a, I do a YouTube show with my buddy John Tilson. Uh, check it out, by the way, if anyone listening. It's called uh, Explaining Things. Um, yeah. It's on the same channel as my stand-up special. Just put Explaining right. Things in there. It's the first thing that pops up on YouTube. I'll put it in the show notes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it, it's it's just, you know, I break, we break stuff down for seven minutes. The idea is um, Jonathan asks uh, an ignorant person how to do something and i'm the ignorant person but you're pretty smart aren't you i mean what if you already know what the thing is um uh, well we we try to make sure i don't okay uh except for if it's a stupid topic then it's fun you know but if i know how to build a fire from scratch that's not funny hmm. which is you know so how are you're a pretty educated guy? I mean, you do a joke uh, in your special about being a lawyer. I can't, I, but again, I don't know. Sometimes I don't know. Are people kidding or this? Like, were you really a lawyer or did you work at a law firm or something? Or what's the story behind that? Just a joke. Just a joke. So you just, did you, did you have a, did you go to college? You have a degree or anything like that? I went to college for like three months. <laughs> okay. They don't have a degree in rape jokes. So I didn't know what I was going to do. <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, you can tell from your comedy that you're really smart. But so, for some people, I feel like school is just not the right uh, avenue for them. Like you said, if they don't have that degree, then. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people do. You know, I, I have a bunch of friends. I've known a bunch of people who got history degrees and they just stand outside cursing the gods every day. You know, you got to you got to get a college degree in the right thing now. You know, yeah, it's, it's not enough of... to just have a four year degree. It's kind of a lot of those degrees now are, are kind of worthless. I feel like most of the people I know that make a lot of money, it's sales and you don't really need, if you can just sell things to people, it, it's like you said with the comedy, like it's, that's what it sounds like those comedians are doing that aren't that great. They're just doing sales and they're selling themselves as comedians, even though they're not that great of comedians. Yeah. It's probably being able to sell yourself and to sell things, being a salesman is just it's an incredible skill to have and you see people just get insanely far in life because they know how to do it even if they're not good at their actual job some people i've seen they just sort of get ahead by selling themselves i'm like dude why don't you just sell jaguars you would destroy it instead of just moving up in companies and fucking up whatever you're in charge of you know no that's you know? very that's a very good point do you think that some people like with the comedians angle do you think that some of them maybe need like a manager like do you have a manager because i feel like if there was a manager who was really good at the sales and all that stuff then you could just be a comedian and the manager could take care of all the other stuff well getting a manager is different than it used to be a manager used to see someone you they used to see a potential uh a talent in someone right i don't know it probably still happens every now and then but it's less and less so um, they used to say like, okay, this guy has, doesn't have his shit together, but he's fucking really good at this. So we can fix everything else around him, make a more streamlined process. We can help him with things he's not good at, the business side, uh, the advertising side. Now people just sort of wait till someone makes it, and then they'll come in and be like, hey, give me 5%. I'll book all your tour dates and shit like that. Uh -huh. You know? That's interesting. Yeah. Cause I was going to say, like, I feel like I see a lot of people who are talented such as yourself. And if I, if I was like a manager type, if that was something I wanted to do, I would, or in bands too, there's a lot of uh, musicians I've interviewed that I'm like, Oh man, a lot I, of, I don't want to manage this band, but there's so much great music out there that we'll never hear. What kind of music do you like? I, I tend towards rock and blues and stuff like that. I also, like uh, uh, the rap from my era as well, you know, Nas, Jay-Z, Mob Deep, Wu-Tang Clan, um, um, uh, classic rock. I, I love Radiohead and Oasis, ACDC, stuff like that. Bruce Springsteen, Neil Young. Is there any, so when you say like there's a lot of uh, new bands, is there any new bands that you're listening to now that you think like, oh, this yeah. band could be big? My my buddy Tilson just got me onto this guy. His name is MJ Letterman, I think. He's got this song called Knockin'. It's like uh, he wrote it based on Knockin' on Heaven's Door by Bob Dylan. It's not a cover. It's his own song, but it's but it's uh, it's called Knockin' on Heaven's Door. And I've started listening to his old stuff because of it. The guy's most his the most views he has on YouTube is like four point five k, something like that. You know, so no one knows who the fuck this guy is, and he's just fucking incredible. Wow, He's incredible. Okay. 
And I just know there's, there's tons of other people like that. And it's, and it's, it's, if there's just not something to sell with them necessarily, it's it, like uh, marketing. When you first start out, marketing is like on you now. It's like on you, I think, for the most part. You got to get views. You got to show that you can get an audience yourself before business comes to help you out. As of before, they had people looking for that next big thing. I, I think now people have to learn how to market themselves. No matter how good they are, they've got to figure it out. No, that's very well said. Yeah, it's interesting. I get I get so many publicity emails a day from like, I can't believe how many bands and some comedians and, and, and filmmakers too, um, that I've just, I've never heard of these people, but they have enough money to hire a publicist. That's always what's interesting to me. I'm like, how did all these people afford a publicist? I don't, know. I don't even know how much a publicist costs. I would never get a publicist. I think it's What's like at point? least a few hundred dollars a month. I think maybe it's different for if you're smaller and they don't do as much, maybe it's a little cheaper. I'm not sure, but I I always thought a publicist wasn't to help you advertise. I, I always thought a publicist was like basically in case you fucked up. Like the publicist was there to spin it so you didn't look that bad. Well, yeah, there's definitely that piece of it. But I think for what I do, they set up the podcast interviews, right? They they send out, you know, press release, like like if you for your special, the publicist would send out the press release, Alan Fitzgerald, new special, you know, and then they would try to book interviews on podcasts and news stations and newspapers and, th and try to get the word out basically. Ah, okay. Well, maybe publicists are doing double duty now. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't, I always just saw a publicist in a movie and they were like crisis control. That's all they right. did. Yeah. I think at the big time levels, that is what they, yeah, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, like, or what is, what do they call like the white house press secretaries or whatever? Like that sound that job sounds like a nightmare trying to spin those things. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Really, really quite terrible. The only really, it's it's a it's a job for disagreeable people, for very disagreeable people, because you have to kind of enjoy going. No, 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 no. You listen to me. You fucking, you know, you know. Yeah. So, as much as it sounds horrible, I think to to, to maybe people like us, I think there's a certain segment of the population that sort of rebels in it. Oh yeah, there's definitely people like I'm sure you like come across people in your life that love to argue with you? Like, have you ever dated a girl like that? Like, oh, like, you're just like, dude, you should be like a lawyer or something. Like, you should be one of those people because you love to argue. You actually enjoy it. I hate it. Yeah. Oh, I can't stand it. I don't, I don't want to argue with anyone ever. They you should know? just give in. I go, okay, you win. Yeah. Yeah, I I, 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 I pick my battles. That's how, that's how you got to look at it. You have to pick your battles. Is this worth it? Right. You know? Absolutely. Well, you mentioned the um, the musician is. Uh, oh, I want to ask you this: Is there any up up and coming comedians that you worked with that you're like, oh, this guy's gonna be the next big thing? Because a couple of years ago, I had um, I don't know if you had Ted, Ted Ted Alexandro. He's a New York comedian. He opened for Jim Gaffigan and stuff. Really funny guy. But I was mm -hmm. asked that question, and he said, oh, well, there's this guy over here called Tim Dillon. He, I think he's pretty funny. And now, like that guy's like blown up. So you guys always know ahead of time. Who's going to be big before they're big? Uh, I I don't know who's going to be big. Um, my who favorite, really like, yeah, it's a, it's a, you know what? It's a Boston guy. There's a couple of Casey Crawford is uh, one of my favorite comedians I've ever seen. Um, and he doesn't have an album or anything out yet. He was going to release one. I think I messaged him about it. You know trying to say like hey come on buddy get your shit out there you know but casey crawford i think is is an incredible comedian he writes some of the best jokes i've ever heard and he has this amazing personality with it too that just fits every single joke in his act um he did jimmy kimmel once but it it, it just it, it didn't lead to what it used to it, what it used to lead to these late night spots but uh yeah he's my he uh, if i could if i could make one guy famous if I said one guy really deserves to be fucking famous, it would probably be him. Okay, I think, wow. I think he's incredible. I got to check him out then. I'd love that. Cause I feel like I, I have the same kind of taste as comedians just because you, you know, you, as a comedian, you've seen so much comedy doing open mics and all the others. And I, and I just watch a lot of comedy. So it takes a lot for me to really 
find a good, I'm kind of picky, I guess. And so, I mean, I like a lot of comedy, but what if I, if I like a comedian like yourself that I really like, where I was like, oh, this special is really good. It has to be, you know, it has to be that level where it's like, it's not just made for the, the dumbed down America kind of boring, clean comedy, I think. Yeah, that, that's how, that's how it is when you get into certain stuff. Like, uh, I think you start off like, like maybe, maybe you start off really liking Garth Brooks, but after a while, I got to guess that doesn't do anything for you either. So you get into other country, you know, like, um, uh, there's one guy, you know what, here's the thing. Casey, unfortunately he doesn't have enough shit on him online. Now look him up, do, if you're listening, look him up, but there's another guy named Dan Bulger, who's uh, fantastic. And he's got some videos on YouTube. Oh yeah. I heard you talking about him on another podcast. Uh, Yeah. I was trying to look that up. I couldn't find the bit you were talking about though. And I, now I can't even remember what it was, but yeah, yeah, him, 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 and uh, Sean Sullivan were like uh, my my two favorite comedians when I was coming up in Boston. I was like the, like this guy Jason Chamberlain. I loved him, uh, just a fucking out there man. But he he fucking quit. He sells off parts now, uh, unfortunately. You oh. know, it, it got it got yeah, it got too much for him. Uh, you know, I I I you know, I mess with him every now and like, hey, you gonna come back? You thinking about it? But he's just he's he, he sort of found peace doing something else. Um, but so do those guys know, that leave, do they, um, continue to do an occasional open mic or like an occasional weekend spot or do it as a hobby at least? I think what happens is some of them come back and they start doing a mic again, but after like, you've been out of it for a year, you're rusty as hell. So that first mic coming back is going to be rough. It's going to suck. So, so do you have what it takes to get on the bike and just keep on going after that? You know, like you can't just do one mic and then you're back. It takes a while to get your rhythm back and everything like that. So I think, you know, sometimes they do, they go back to it, they do it again and everything, but there's just, it's not the same because they would have to do it a lot for them to get back at that level. Oh, also my buddy, Craig Boudria, he was really talented, but he, he started a business and he's got a family. So Wow. You know, yeah. It's yeah. So, so sad to see that. Like I see it with music too, where I see these musicians that are super talented and then they just go a different route or whatever, or they quit. And you're just like, Oh, it's like sad to see that talent go to waste, but I get it too, because yeah, you got to eat. And, uh, sometimes a lot of these business things, you make more money doing that. Yeah. It's when you got a family, it's not about you anymore. That's why I, 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 I don't have a family, you know, I don't have a wife and kids. So it is just about me. So I can follow my gay little dreams. Like a lot of people can't fucking do that once, you know, you know, they, they just can't that what comes first is their kids eating, uh, their kids, you know, have it, they're, you know, just building a life for them and it costs money. And like I said, it took me 11, maybe even 12 goddamn years just to scratch out enough money for me to survive, you know? That's crazy. So the time, the 12 years, and then, yeah, obviously not making the sacrifice, not having kids, not having a wife and all that stuff. And then I think, too, it sounds like um, another big piece of it that I've kind of picked up from doing these interviews is being in the right place. Like, you're in New York City. If you were trying to do this in, like, Wyoming or something, it would be a lot harder. Yes. Yeah, it'd be impossible. Almost impossible. Well, but then you see all these TikTok people. What I know that's a very different thing, but you can go viral on TikTok without without ever having been on a stage. Yeah, that's different though. There's making it as a comedian and then there's people who uh make it on TikTok and then make money being a stand-up comedian. A very poor, horrible stand-up comedian usually. Um, but, um, like that's, that's complete. If you want to make it as a stand up comedy, that means you have to get good at stand up comedy. Yeah, no, that's absolutely well, right. for the most part. Well, and I think, but some of them, I don't know if they started in stand up and then they did the TikTok thing and the TikTok thing took off over the stand up and now they're going back to the stand up. Like, like Scott Sice, I don't know his story, but like, I know he's a stand up comedian. But he did that uh, Ikea uh, character thing that he did on TikTok and that thing blew up. And so then I don't I'm assuming that's what helped boost his fame as a stand up comedian. And then now he's in like movies. He's in that uh, cocaine bear movie and stuff like that. I don't know if you've ever seen his stuff. Yeah, I saw his Ikea stuff. It was yeah. pretty funny stuff. Yeah, that's all, anybody who's ever worked retail like can relate to that. Yeah, 
I worked retail once. I worked at the fucking Christmas tree shop. It's, just, it's like a New England chain of just bullshit, just uh, just cheap bullshit. It was horrible. Working retail really sucks. Working retail and fast food really, really sucks. Oh, wait, which fast food place did you work at? I work fast food. McDonald's. Ooh, is that good? Is that one of the better ones, though? To no. Worst? Worst. I, I don't know. I never worked in another one. I said, I said, I'm never working in food again after that experience. And I was only like 15, 14, something like that. You know, why I would think that would be the worst one is because it's such a it's such a popular thing that you're always busy, which some people like. But I worked at this place in uh, in Seattle and it was called Skippers and it was like a local. It was like kind of like an uh, what do you call the fish and like Long John Silver's it was like a knockoff of that. But okay. nobody ever came in. So we just all that we just fucked around and we like ate uh, chicken and fish strip uh, fish sticks and then fries. And they had these things called clam strips and they were deep fried clams. Oh my mm. God. Best thing. And we, we always just make them. We're like, Oh, we're making these in case anybody orders them. Nobody ever ordered them, but they were delicious. <laughs> so I, that, I loved a job with good downtime, man. Oh, that was just the best. There was, there's nothing better than just hanging out. You know, at shitty jobs. You kind of meet the coolest people. Yes. I agree. You really do. Yeah, no, that's always fun. Just hanging out with people, just shooting the shit and uh, mm -hmm. learning about the people. Yeah. And then when you, when it, when things get busy, like that's what McDonald's sounds so stressful to me. You go in there and people are running around. And I'm like, I worked at Chili's as a, as a cook in the back. Oh my, that was the worst job I ever had. So hot. And like, you're just sweating for, and it was like 12 hour shifts or something. It was insane. <laughs> uh, not go back to that. 12 hour shifts. Uh, dude, I, I, I've had so many shitty jobs, so many shitty jobs. I think this is, I think you need to work like a lot of shitty jobs in order to finally get a good one. I think that's how that works. I think there's some karma or something. Because I remember I was packaging frozen seafood for a little bit. I couldn't handle the smell. Um, I was doing that for way too long, making minimum wage. But they would give you lots of overtime. So I'd work like six, 52, 54 hours a week. And I'd get time and a half on the on the extra ones. So I made a okay money. Um, but it was, it, was, it was really horrible. I was a bill collector two separate times. The three times. One time I worked for a law firm, um, but I, I but I, I got I got fired from that one. Um, I worked at a CCA. I was a collect. I was like, I did three different senses as a bill collector. I, I did four or five in customer service slash telemarketing. Um, one in retail. One in fast food. Uh, I just I did all these shitty shitty jobs. When you start doing something. Something happens in life where you just have to do that over and over again because it's the only thing in your resume, you know? It's the worst. But don't you think that <laughs> maybe was that part of the motivation to try stand up to be like, dude, I got to do something with my life. I can't be freaking packing frozen fish food for the rest of my life. Like, doesn't that motivate you? Because I know that those three weeks that I only worked there three weeks at Chili's, but that was enough for me to go, okay, I got to do something different with my life. I got to go to college or something because it was hell. I couldn't imagine yeah. doing yeah, 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 yeah. You figure it out. Yeah, you figure it. It's like um, it's it's almost. Sometimes I wonder if I, if I just if I, what I what I like more, uh, stand up comedy or do I just love not having a fucking job? You know, not having a boss, not having not having a half hour lunch break. That's a joke. Half I mean, a, a name hour. tag. A name, tag, a name, is name tag. Yeah. Having to wear oh. khaki pants and tuck in your shirt and stuff like tuck in your shirt. I'm fat as fuck, dude. My shirt comes untucked all the time. There's nothing I can goddamn do about it. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> you, ever, yeah, you ever get like written up for that? You're like, dude, I can't. This is, my shirt doesn't tuck in. <sighs> I, I've never gotten written up for it, but just people like, Alan, tuck in your shirt. Like, oh, you fucking. All right. You know. It is what it is, though. I'm not doing it anymore. Neither are you. Thank Fucking, God. I know, dude. Seriously, Ooh. it's it's pretty incredible. That's what most people do sometimes. Like I think think that most people they just have to go somewhere they hate for half their day every day. Well, I think some people prefer. Like I always talk about. Um, even you know, I always want to own my own business, or I always want, I, I don't ever want to have a boss again. Cause like I feel like once I turned 40, I was like, dude, I feel like I'm too old to have a boss. 
have somebody tell you what to do. You feel like a little kid, but some mm-hmm. people really like that. Some people really like going to the military and having direct orders from and knowing exactly what's coming. And so I guess teach their own. Yeah. Also, I mean, I used to always, I never did, I was never good at following directions, but you know, I would still get the job done most places. That was, that was my thing. Like whenever I worked in sales, they always had a script for me to read. And I always hated reading the script. And I, I almost never did it because I just figured out my own way to do things, talk to them my own way. I felt when I read a script, people could tell I was reading a script and I hated the fact I was reading a script. So the motherfucker on the other end of the phone is going to know, like, I don't give a fuck, you know? So like people tell you how to do things. If you ever figure out your own way to do things, people don't like it because they want everyone to do the same thing, which is fine. It's their company. It's their, they, 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 the way they want to run it, but it just never worked for me. It just never did. No, that's exactly right. I totally agree. Uh, I was just talking to my girlfriend about this yesterday about when people read the scripts, when they do the phone call sales and stuff. And also like, I remember like when you're, I'm sure you've watched these videos, like the corporate videos, when you get a job and you get hired, like here, here's your training. And it's this, these totally fake reenactments of customer service. And like how you're going to handle is you're going to say like, okay, ma'am, you know, it's the same thing basically as a script, as a script, like you're mm-hmm. acting totally fake. And I feel like people can pick up on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's completely fake. Then you get to the real life job at McDonald's and some fat woman is calling you a pussy who can't do your job. And she's got 10 kids screaming. <laughs> she's like, they didn't show this in the video. I don't know what to do. <laughs> That's not what I ordered, retard. Oh, that was not. I have no idea. How am I supposed to? How am I, like, Let me consult just... the script and see what it says when the fat lady calls me a retard. Uh... <laughs> Actually, ma'am, that is not the politically correct term. And, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, there's really no no way to prepare you. No way to prepare you for the hell that is uh, customer service. Yeah, well, as a comedian, you get heckled, though. You, you like It seems like most comedians have respo- like kind of canned responses to heckling. Do you have those responses, like, prepared? No, no I, I try to live in the moment. Usually a heckler will punch themselves out. You learn that in comedy pretty early, I think. Honestly, most of the time, the best thing is make, what was that, sir? Like, literally 75% of the time, they won't respond. Oh. You know? You know? Because, you know, a, a smart person who has their shit together is not going to heckle a comedy show. Well, that's true. What What about, like, um, do you ever do, like, the roast battles and stuff? Or have you ever done, like, Kill Tony or one of those things? Because those are really fascinating. I mean... When I did do comedy, I would always like script out my jokes. I'm not good like on the fly, but I'm always fascinated by comedians that can come back with a quick wit like that. Mm-hmm. I, I've I've done a couple of roast battles. I don't like them. To be honest, I don't like doing any of this. I just like doing stand-up comedy. And I've done a couple of roasts. They were fun because you're roasting a buddy. Everyone knows each other. It's pretty weird when you just when like someone will put on a roast battle and you'll just have to go around, go against someone you don't know, you know, you're just standing Uh, in front of them and all you know is that they're fat, they're Jamaican and their mom just died. And you just have to go at them like from that, just, just as hard as you can. It just, it feels (laughs) weird to me. I just picturing Steven Seagal in that moment. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, oh yeah wow well on that note uh well thank you for doing this uh people should check out the special it's called what is it called straight for pay hilarious special watch it last night i've also seen a lot of the stuff on the clips as, as well um so people can check out the clips and see it see it for uh if it's for them but i recommend just watching the whole uh special because it's only like 37 minutes or something right yeah yeah no one knows who i am so i wasn't gonna make people watch me for an hour you know it's a daunting task you know, I think watching a comedian for an hour and you don't know who the fuck he is, but 30, I was originally going to make it 30 minutes, but I kept the an extra seven in just because I liked it. Uh, but 37 minutes, you can do that. You can fucking watch me for 37 minutes. Or you can just put it on YouTube and hit the repeat button and you can go to the store and just give him the views. Be a nice guy. 
Yes. Also, you can send me duffel bags and cash if you would like. You can do that as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Why <laughs> not? Help out a young starving artist. You know. Let's yes. Yes. If you're, you're young, attract- if you're a young, attractive woman, you could live in my house and blow me whenever I ask too. There's lots of ways you can help me out. I just awesome. didn't think of them like that. Well, Thank and they you, can Chuck. follow you on social media and uh, subscribe to your YouTube channel. I'll put all that stuff in the show notes. Uh, do you have a website yeah. that, or link tree or one of those things? Follow me on Instagram at Fuck City USA. It's also my uh, t- TikTok and my Instagram and in, in my uh, Twitter at Fuck City USA. It's also my Venmo, weirdly enough. I don't know why that that was allowed, but it's at Fuck City USA. I know. I'm and, surprised uh, they let you say fuck in the in on Instagram and all that stuff. That's crazy. Well, I. I didn't space, so they don't know. They can just think it's a Portuguese name or something. They have no idea. (laughs) Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Alan. And uh, yeah, I look forward to new uh, specials from you. And if you ever get down to Phoenix and do a show, let me know. I'll come see you. Thanks, Chuck. I will. You have a good one. All right, you too. Thanks again, man. Bye-bye. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the full podcast episode. Please help support our guests by following them on social media and purchasing their products, whether it be a book, album, film, or other thing. And if you have a few extra dollars, please consider donating it to their favorite charity. If you want to support the show, you can like, share, and comment on this episode on social media and YouTube. And if you want to go the extra mile, you can give us a rating or review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts. Finally, make sure you're subscribed to the show on YouTube for the video versions and other exclusive content. We appreciate your support. Have a great rest of your day and shoot for the moon.